Baby dinosaurs, as we've come to know across the history of the field of paleontology, are known of for being notoriously rare, hard to find, and more often than not, incomplete. This goes for even the most well understood of taxa, including Tyrannosaurus rex, among the most well known of all. Said rareness has led to much of their anatomy from this stage in life being inferred of from what we know from other animals, and from such calculations, especially regarding their proportions, they can often have some very funny results, including this one in particular, which will be discussed here. Virtually unrepresented by fossils, the first remains attributable to Tyrannosaurs of a given young age were described only recently in 2021 by Greg Funston and colleagues, when a foot claw and a lower jaw, all from individuals determined to still being in their embryonic stage at the time of their deaths. Found at different fossil sites in Western North America, both date to around 75 to 71 million years ago, with the claw being uncovered at a site in the Horseshoe Canyon Formation in 2018 in Alberta, with the jaw being found in the Two Medicine Formation of Montana in 1983 although their identification as belonging to Tyrannosaurs took a while afterwards to come to pass, due to the jaw being encased in rock that meant fully visualising it without the technology of 3D scanners, like how we have today, would have been much more difficult. From estimates done of the jaw and toe bones, it was estimated that the jaw came from an animal that was about 2.5 feet long, likely a Displetosaurus, and the toe claw to an animal a little over 3 feet, nearly a metre, which likely belonged to an Albertosaurus, both animals that could have reached lengths of around 9 metres when fully grown. Four embryos that would have been close to hatching, such sizes are incredibly large considering they were still in their eggs. In fact, the largest known animals to have yet emerged from an egg, which from what we know of how big these individuals would have been, the eggs they would have been curled up in would have also been very large, estimated as about 43 centimetres in length when inferred from known non-avian theropod eggs. The jaw especially was very similar to that of older juvenile tyrannosaurs and adult animals, and that while their proportions would have indeed been very different considering their age, were still recognisable as tyrannosaurs from birth. Their proportions indicate that they were more than likely precocial, hence being active and able to hunt down their own foods once hatched, although they more than likely needed some decent level of attention from their parents slash parents when they were younger. This recent study has shed some much needed lights on both the size and proportions of baby tyrannosaurs, although a complete picture of their entire osteology is still far and away from being a complete one. To date, the main and so far only sufficient way to restore their life appearance to some degree of scientific rigour has been to extrapolate the proportions from older individuals, something which has been done for many years, at least 50, and even now, the models vary. The first attempt at predicting their anatomy once hatched came from paleontologist Dale Russell in his 1970 paper, who predicted the proportions of a hatchling Gorgosaurus by calculating the scaling trajectories of larger individuals and then projecting them to an individual with a 100mm long femur, the results of which can be seen here. He found that as Tyrannosaurs matured, their presacral vertebral column, alongside other assorted elements like their pubis and ischium, all increased in size more rapidly than their femurs, with their skulls, sacrum and humerus, not to mention their forearms, all growing isometrically when compared with the femur, meaning the small forelimbs in adults were more than likely present in even the youngest of animals. The tail, hands, tibia and metatarsus, alongside the pairs, would have experienced negative, allometric growth, becoming proportionally shorter as they grew. Russell's scaling showed them as long-legged, long-tailed and small-bodied animals that were clearly pretty different to their parents, a consequence of allometry where the proportions differ between ages, something especially pronounced in tyrannosaurs. The animal was estimated at dog size, just over 75 centimetres in length, with some aspects of the model, including the shapes of the bones themselves, being created by juvenilising the bone shapes of adult animals, and remains a good skeletal given its age, matching closely with what has been observed in other non-avian dinosaur embryos and hatchlings, which are generally long-legged themselves. Still remaining as one of the only published hatchling tyrannosaur skeletals widely available, it has most definitely been utilised in lots of paleoarts and dinosaur documentaries, especially considering the length of time it's been around. Another go as estimating their proportions came from Phil Curry, a notable Tyrannosaur researcher who, armed with more specimens and therefore more data, was able to provide a more informed scaling, at least from what was currently known. As before with Russell, Curry scaled an individual with a 100mm long femur, and the result was again dog-sized. The Tyrannosaur it was modelled on wasn't specified by Curry, so the resulting data can be interpreted as a generic Tyrannosaurid, although Albertosaurian scaling metrics were prioritised, where they differed significantly from those of Tyrannosaurians, leading to a more gracile build overall. Considering his results were only presented in a data table, and the resultant hypothetical hatchling was not illustrated, an image by Mark Whitson was done to showcase what said animal would have looked like in life, and well, it's certainly a very weird look. The body of the animal isn't too dissimilar to Russell's calculations, although they differ substantially regarding the legs. The tibia is 60% longer, and the metatarsals an incredible 220% longer, 
giving them a very stilt-like look, putting even most thin-legged waiting birds to shame. All in all, a very peculiar result indeed. The implications of said proportions resulting in this, if seriously considered, would be immense when it comes to tyrannosaur life history and habits, whether or not they were waders, highly adept sprinters or hoppers likely being relevant hypotheses to look into. Of course though, no one seriously considers these proportions as realistic, as comical as they look, with the outlandish proportions being dismissed by Curry in the paper soon after being introduced, with him noting, quote, there are limitations to what can be done in extrapolating this data, end quote. Said results were not, however, errors, or the outputs of wrongful methodology, however, as are simply the results of legitimate and normal scaling equations. The limitations noted by Curry refer to the fundamental difficulties with scaling their proportions outside of observed ranges, with low sample sizes and scaling curves being skewed by outliers and low confidence levels, although it's unusual in that these problems are being used to scale small animals, instead of trying to scale a smaller animal to the size of the adults. Recalculation and comparison does indeed produce similar results for some elements, but wildly different ones for others. And while the said reconstruction here, with the tibia being more than twice as long as the femur, indeed being unlikely and unrealistic, the true length does likely fall within the 95% confidence interval, although said range is quite a big one. It is easy to interpret said data as being likely wrong because they're so unusual, although concerning proportions that are not currently known of from the fossil records, which means that more often than not, paleontologists have to extrapolate and dismiss data limits with dealing with certain unknowns, and to acknowledge the unreliable nature of the math that is used. Because of this, many extrapolations we're familiar with might be just as wacky as this lanky looking hatchling, although we don't yet see them as wrong. While not accurately reflecting their true appearance, it does serve as a great visualisation of the allometry expressed in Tyrannosaur ontogeny, with it giving a good view as to how their bodies would have grown as they went from a tiny hatchling to a massive adult. The head's length indeed remains proportional to femur length and the arms growing relatively slowly, although there are a range of different growth changes, and length increases can instead be down to deepening instead, particularly in their skulls. Considering the absurd scaling of Curry's Tyrannosaur model, Tyrannosaur ontogeny, while not being as extreme as seen here, might not be too far off. Both Curry's and Russell's data points do indicate more moderately long legged and shallow bodied animals, with them gradually bulking up as they got older before experiencing a massive growth surge midway through their life cycle. Today, the data still needed to more accurately map out hatchling tyrannosaurs and their complete life appearance is still limited due to the lack of data, although more recent studies like as mentioned at the start of this video have finally been able to factor in some embryonic fossil material into the equation, giving us a more clear view than we have had before. The 95% confidence intervals for many of these predictions are still large however, which means that their true proportions may still be pretty different from what we know. For example, the Albutosaurus dentary mentioned earlier pointed to a body length of around 0.7 metres, but with a confidence interval ranging anywhere from 0.4 to 0.8 metres, and the Displetosaurus toe claw being scaled to just over a metre, although their range is even bigger, from 0.2 metres to nearly 6 metres in length, pointing to a very big range which clearly points to there being some discrepancies. Such ranges are not too constrained, meaning that these upper estimates would be more expected of animals that are already several years old and are therefore far and away larger than would ever be reasonably expected for any hatchling. What is good to know is that their general form and our understanding of them is generally on the right track, although finding more specifically reliable body proportions for hatchling tyrannosaurs still has a ways to go, and finding a reasonably complete skeleton would be the best way in resolving this uncertainty, in spite of their rarity. Paleontologists do often collect many specimens in one go, that means getting to all of them takes a long while, and many are often left forgotten in drawers and study areas all around the world. And so, other baby tyrannosaur specimens may well be out there in museum collections, waiting to be rediscovered and properly described, which would go a long way in our understanding of these imposing animals and their diminutive beginnings. Much of what I've discussed in this video came from a blog post done on this topic by paleontologist and artist Mark Whitten, who has a swath of other posts on a range of other, just as interesting topics, and you can check them out here in the top right if you're interested. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these animals, and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and with that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.